Double battles. Team preview, bring six, pick four. This rule set probably sounds familiar to many of you, as it has been the standard Pokemon video game championship rule set since 2008 with Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. But this is actually the rule set from Pokemon Journey Across America, a 2006 tournament series which spanned 23 tournaments and six months, ultimately leading to a showdown in New York City for one person to be crowned the national champion and win a diamond studded Nintendo DS along with a trip to Japan. But what was this format like, and what type of efforts did players have to go through to acquire their teams in Gen 3, one of the most notoriously unfriendly generations to collect them all in? Today I'm going to show you all of that and more by recreating Min Ba Le's Journey Across America national winning team from nothing without glitches or hacking. I'll be building his team from scratch on a freshly completed copy of Pokemon Emerald. I want to match the natures, moves, EVs, and items identically to Min's team. I want to know what Game Freak thought was acceptable for a new player to do once they beat the game, insofar as team construction goes. And I want to see how difficult this is compared to what we're used to in Gen 8 and 9, where there's a lot of things that help us build teams very quickly and easily. With that said, I won't be allowing any glitches. This includes cloning and duping, Hame glitching, and arbitrary code execution. All of these glitches are extremely powerful and would trivialize a lot of the process. Single-use TMs, single-use move tutors, no quick way to level up, these are all intentional design decisions by Game Freak that I would like to examine through the lens of Min's team. So, is anything interesting allowed then? Well, for one, I'm allowing RNG manipulation as always. It isn't a glitch, and it's actually almost required to get good Pokémon in Emerald version. I will also be playing all of my games with the dead internal battery. This shouldn't really affect very much, but if something is made more irritating or easier because of it, I will bring it up. Lastly, I'll be trying to make this team as fast as I can with 17 years of hindsight, using all of the newest and best methods available to me, to see what the theoretical fastest time you could build his team was. So I'll be running a live timer that will be on screen at all times to keep track of how long all of this took. I'll also be starting with a presumed completed copy of Pokemon Emerald, and a completed copy of Pokemon XD. Any other game will have to be played through from scratch, and that playthrough will add to the timer. With that said, let's start with the setup. While trying to find the team, it came to my realization that because the Journey Across America tournament was a long time ago, it is both not super well documented, and the documentation that does exist is scattered across about a dozen old websites, forum threads, and war stories. So I want to take you on my journey to finding the full team with all of the details. So I decided to search YouTube and Google the best I could to find any other Journey Across America matches, and I came across this excellent video by Scott MTC. It's a one and a half hour breakdown of the Journey Across America metagame. The video itself was entertaining, but it wasn't helpful for finding out Min's team. I still encourage everyone to check this video out though if you're interested in the meta itself. It's all in Italian, but it's fully subtitled in English. A great watch. What was helpful though was the comments and the description of the video, where he had his entire list of sources posted in a pastebin. After combing through them, I found three extremely useful pastes. First, I found Min's war story from his Washington DC regional win. The way this format worked was that there were 23 regional tournaments leading up to the finals in Bryant Park, New York. To get invited to the finals, you had to win a regional. After winning his regional, Min posted a war story on Smogon. A war story is the general story of your time at the event, your team, and the ways all your battles went. On top of all of this, Min detailed how he bred and raised the team, listed the items for some and the moves for some as well. During every relevant section, I'll bring up what Min did and I'll compare it to my strategy to see which was more effective. In total, he used five games. Pokemon Fire Red, Sapphire, Emerald, XD, and Pokemon Box Ruby Sapphire. This was Min's optimal game setup. In 2006, if you had paid retail for everything, this would have cost $99 for the GBA, $199 for the GameCube, $34.99 for Emerald, Fire Red, and Sapphire, $50 for XD Gale of Darkness and Pokemon Box Ruby Sapphire, and about $15 for the GameCube to GBA link cable. This is an astounding $518 in 2006 money, aka $728 accounting for inflation. This is an unacceptable financial barrier to competing in competitive Pokemon. You literally definitively have an advantage for owning more games, because several of these games has exclusive move tutor moves that are unique only to them. Alright, so the war story lets me know how he built his team, but we still don't know all of it. Cradilly was not even on the Washington DC team, so what were the other sources that I found? Well, in the comments section there was an update from Scott MTC. What happened here was that Min's brother had actually seen the video, and commented with some extra info and Min's war story from the Nationals. This war story gives the full moveset and items for every Pokemon on Min's team, as well as Min's perspective of his tournament winning run. I highly recommend you give it a read. His team has what appears to be some strange move choices, and I'll elucidate his perspective on those decisions as we tackle each Pokemon. In that very same update post, there was a Japanese website listed that has a bunch of teams from the Journey Across America tournament, including Min's. This lists Snorlax as having the ability Thick Fat, and also confirms all of the moveset and item descriptions from Min's war story. 
The only thing missing now was the EVs and the nature of the Pokemon. So I took a long shot and reached out to Min's brother from the YouTube comments to see if he could get in contact with Min to ask what his EV spreads and natures were. Just one day later, he emailed me back with everything I needed. So this is it. The whole team is here. I want to give a big thanks to Scott MTC, as well as Min and his brother Long for providing all the details. Thanks to all of them, we now have a recovered piece of VGC history. At first glance, this team might not seem so bad to acquire. Emerald and Fire Red alone can get me every single Pokemon I need, and the only TM I need two of for this team is Aerial Ace. But there's a big issue. Min has the move Self-Destruct on his Mewtwo. The only way to get this move is by playing through Pokemon XD. No big deal, it's 2006 and I'm a Pokemon super fan. I've already played XD, and I can just trade over Mewtwo and teach it self-destruct there, right? Well, yes, but it's a single-use move tutor. And he doesn't just have self-destruct on Mewtwo, he also has it on Snorlax. That means you need two completed save files of Pokemon XD. The reason it has to be played through twice is 1. XD and Kahlo both prevent you from copying your save file to a second memory card. And 2. While the move is accessible from the moment you reach a gate village, you cannot trade in or out of Pokemon XD until you complete the entire single player adventure. So no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have to play XD twice. This means minimum you need 3 games and 4 full game playthroughs. You also need 2 GameCube memory cards, which, while not a deal breaker, it does add about $22,006 to our total cost. And for those who are doubting that this would need to happen, Min actually complains about it in his Washington War story that he had to buy XD just to learn self-destruct and he wasn't happy about it. Okay, so we have the whole team. Now let's talk about the format rules and restrictions so we can better plan our route through Gen 3 to optimize the team building. In many ways, Journey Across America is a precursor to modern VGC. It has the standard bring 6 pick 4 double battle format you've come to know and love. It had item claws and it even had team preview. This is something even early Gen 4 VGC didn't have. This was also what is known as a restricted format, where typically banned powerful legendaries were allowed. Most modern restricted VGC formats limit you to two of these Pokémon, but in the journey across America you can have as many as you wanted. The only banned Pokémon were Mew, Celebi, Jirachi, Deoxys, and the Soul Dew item, which were all event-only or unique distributions that weren't regularly available to everybody. There was no dex or moveset restriction otherwise. So you can aim to use some rare moves from Pokemon XD, for example. Lastly, this format is played at level 100, and there is no auto level in Pokemon XD. So you have to get all of your own Pokemon to level 100. Now that we understand the format, let's break down every game that is absolutely required and why. Emerald is technically only needed for the move Endure, which is exclusive to the Battle Frontier. Otherwise, you could use Ruby and Sapphire. But it is also faster to get many of the health items here via the BP system. For my purposes, it also is the game with the most flexible and easy to use RNG minips, so it is highly preferred to Ruby and Sapphire in that case. Fire Red is only needed for Mewtwo and Clefairy. I also use it to get a Snorlax, although you could technically get one in XD if you wanted. Lastly is XD, which we only need for the Move Tutor for Self Destruct. I do not think you can minimize this game count in any way. Using this many games does give me a few small benefits. For one, I do need many TMs, so I can get them whichever way is easiest across every single one of these games. I can also get the rare candies, PP maxes, and PP ups available in every game, which will minimize the farming that I'll have to do later on. Lastly, Ruby and Sapphire are not required, but using them as secondary games for some grinding will help a lot. I think if I don't use them, the time easily doubles for this challenge. So I'll be using partially completed copies of both of them. So with that, I'll begin my playthroughs. First up is Fire Red, where I play through the entire game with my trusty Blastoise. Along the adventure, I make sure to collect the TMs for Aerial Ace, Toxic, and Earthquake. You may think the journey is over once I hit the Hall of Fame, but if you did, you clearly never played this game. You see, if I want both access to Cerulean Cave for Mewtwo, and to be able to trade with other games other than Fire Red and Leaf Green, I must complete the Sevi Islands post-game quest and collect the Ruby and Sapphire for Celio. But to even unlock this quest, you need to collect 60 Pokémon and get the National Dex from Professor Oak, so I have to spend a bunch of my time getting 60 Pokémon so that I could then go to Celio and do his quest. And then finally, we're connected to Hoenn and Orr. In total, it took me 5 hours and 24 minutes to play through Fire Red. Not bad, but all the requirements to trade added like 2 hours to this playthrough. It is so ridiculous that they made you do this. Min mentioned in his war story that Fire Red was the game that he played through repeatedly to collect TMs and rare items, and he played through the post game so he could trade into other games or Pokemon Box. For the life of me, if you're going to do this, I cannot imagine why you would be using Fire Red as the game you played through repeatedly. It is significantly longer than both Emerald or Sapphire, both games that he actually had. The post-game quest adds a lot of time to the runs. 
He does mention that he's most familiar with Gen 1 in general, so perhaps he just knew the Kanto region better than the others. I think the best game to replay here would be Ruby or Sapphire, unless you need more than one of the one-time move tutors. Luckily, because of the way I'm doing things, I won't need to be playing any game more than once other than Pokemon XD. Speaking of, it's time for XD. This is unfortunately nothing more than a blast through the game. I just use Espeon and Ursaring the entire time. There's really nothing interesting to collect through the game either. I do happen to find Shadow Ball during the playthrough though, which means I won't have to go out of my way to find it for Snorlax using either of the other games anyway. I make my way through Team Cypher until I defeat the legendary XD001, and then I head to Fenac City to await trading time. All of this takes me 9 hours and 36 minutes, a huge time sink compared to Fire Red. Part of the issue is that A, I'm less familiar with XD, so despite it being more linear, I don't always remember where to go. B, you can't turn animations off. And C, double battles are slower than singles. And XD is almost entirely double battles. This leads to battles being very slow paced in combinations with animations being on, compared to a main series game anyway. The only thing Min mentioned about XD was that he was upset he had to purchase it just for self-destruct. I can't believe he didn't complain about having to play through it more than once. Although I guess if you're playing through Fire Red multiple times, this might not seem like such a big deal. In general, I agree, it's ridiculous that you have to buy it just for one move. I think I'm beginning to see why Pokemon Company International limited these types of moves later on, and they prevented transfer moves. The only other thing to note here is that in all of Fire Red, Emerald, and XD, I refrained from using my Master Ball. This means that I have exactly three of them to use for the legendaries for this team. Anyway, with all of the games having been completed, we can finally move on to getting our party. Before I start getting Pokemon, let's talk about Min's IVs. Min mentioned in the email I received that while Groudon was trained all the way to the max in HP, its HP IV was a 29, meaning its stat wasn't the truly maximum possible number. This is because unlike modern Pokemon games, in Gen 3 there is no way to increase the amount of guaranteed 31 IVs on a Pokemon other than through breeding. This means if you want a 631 IV Legendary with a Modest Nature, for example, you need to get a 1 out of 32 roll 6 times consecutively, and then a 1 out of 25 roll for the Nature, because Synchronize does not work on static encounters in this game. If you do the math, it comes out to be a 1 out of 26 billion chance for that to happen. Now, luckily, thanks to the total RNG size of the Gen 3 games, it's actually a bit more common than that. There's only 4.2 billion Nature and IV spreads that exist within the game, and three of them are modest with six IVs. This means that it's actually a far more reasonable 1 in 1.4 billion chance for you to get the spread that you want. Wait, that's not reasonable at all! <laughs> uh, because of this rarity, if you were to soft reset for this specific Mewtwo, even with how fast Fire Red resets are, at a conservative 30 seconds for catching plus stat checking, it would take you 95 years to have a 51% chance of seeing this Pokémon. So Min and other national players obviously didn't do this. In Min's case, he just compromised on his stats. We can see this with his Groudon. He didn't even compromise only the stats he viewed as less valuable, he compromised everything. HP was one of the stats he trained to the maximum, and he didn't even aim for a 31 in this. Why? Well, he probably aimed to have every stat above a certain threshold, rather than having two 31 IVs and then like a bunch of 5s. But how did Min get these Pokémon? Well, in his war story, he talks about how he got lucky and caught a Groudon with great IVs, and that because Synchronize doesn't work on Ubers, it took hours to get each one. As we can see from this, Min was soft resetting for his legendaries. So presumably his Groudon and Rayquaza were caught using this technique in Emerald. You may expect me to compromise like Min, because of how rare these Pokémon are, and how long it might take me to get them. But I won't. I'll be going for 5 or 6 IV Pokémon depending on what stats they need. And I'm willing to bet I got all my Pokémon even faster than Min did. How will I do this without taking 100 years? Well, I'll be using a technique known as RNG manipulation. Because the GBA cannot produce truly random results, Game Freak did their best to fake it and make it look random to us. They did this by using a pseudo-random number generator, which is an algorithm that takes in an input, does some maths to it, and then gives the end user an output that looks random. Both Fire Red and Emerald use a linear congruential generator, with different methods to determine the initial seeding for it. After the initial seeding, the game runs the LCG RNG every video frame. Because of this, my Pokémon will be determined by a 1 60th of a second timing window for when I press A to encounter it. This means if we know the initial seed, we can predict the output using a special calculator known as Gen 3 Seed Assistant, and we will know what Pokémon spawn and when. In Emerald, the initial seed is actually always the same. Zero. This is because of a programming error. Many people think it has to do with a dead internal battery, but Emerald is the only game where that's not the case. This means if you're soft resetting, like Min was, for both his eggs and legendaries in this game, you're actually hitting roughly the same 52-100 IV spreads every time. So not only was soft resetting not efficient, it was basically a waste of time. On top of this, having only one initial seed means our options are very limited for available IV spreads. For example, 
On the initial seed zero, there's only one spread with perfect HP, attack, and speed, and it's a 30 minute wait. Luckily, Emerald is more flexible than it first appears, and there's a way around this using the battle record from the Frontier Trainer Pass and the paintings in the Pokemon Contest Hall. Wait, what? This can get a bit complicated. So let's use the Groudon I end up catching as an example to take you through the RNG process for Emerald version. For reasons unknown to both man and god, when you talk to the contest hall paintings to view the winner of a Pokemon contest, the initial seeding function is called. It determines the seed based on the number of times the GBA renders a video frame, which, just like the RNG itself, is running at 60 frames per second. I take advantage of this by finding a seed where a 5 IV adamant Pokemon will spawn relatively close to me. I use a timer to hit the seed that I want, and I verify that I'm on the correct one by catching a wild Pokemon and checking its stats. After that, I go into the battle factory and I instantly lose a match and I save it as a battle record. The battle record is a replay system for you to save one match to your trainer card in Emerald, either from Link battles or from Frontier matches. The GBA actually doesn't store a video, it just saves both teams' data, their move selection, and critically, the RNG state of the battle. It's actually just recreating everything one move at a time. This means that we can effectively save our position in the RNG after hitting a new seed, almost like a save state, but on actual hardware. After that, we are about 100,000 advances away from our target Groudon. This is a 27 minute wait. So I do the wait again until I'm 5,000 advances away and then I make a new updated battle record. At this point, it's a simple matter of going to Terra Cave and saving in front of the Groudon. I just have to open my battle record, wait the 5,000 advances, and step towards Groudon at the right 1 60th of a second window. In the end, it took me 1 hour and 43 minutes to get Quesadilla the 5 IV adamant Groudon. There was a lot of waiting around via the painting, but the upside to this is that Rayquaza will be really fast now, because it uses the exact same nature and IV spread. For Rayquaza, the only prep I had to do was trade over the Master Ball from Pokemon XD. After that, it was a simple 5,000 advance wait until I landed on it. It only took me 25 minutes to get Enchilado the 5 IV Adamant Rayquaza, and no joke, 5 of those minutes was trading to XD. So I'm done with Emerald for now, but we'll come back to it later for breeding. Right now, I just want to catch every Pokemon I need in general. So I'll be going to Fire Red, who I need for Mewtwo, Clefairy, and Snorlax. But first, let's cover the differences between its and Emerald's RNG, and why it's quite a bit more difficult here. Unlike Emerald version, Fire Red's RNG isn't broken, and it generates its initial seed when you press A on the title screen. Pressing A here causes the GBA to pull some data from one of its internal CPU registers, and it uses that to seed the LCG RNG algorithm. The timing for this A press is very strict, as the GBA checks this register every time a video frame is rendered, every 1 60th of a second. After that, the LCG RNG moves forward just as it does in Emerald, every 1 60th of a second as well. This means to succeed at this RNG manip, I have to hit a 1 60th of a second window two times consecutively. There is no way to store your current RNG state like there is in Emerald. Luckily, because its seeding actually works, we have a ton of initial seeds to choose from. For Mewtwo, I want to run a modest nature with 6 perfect IVs. I chose to have a perfect attack stat as well since Min ran self-destruct, which is a physical move, despite using a modest nature. Here I aimed for seed BC75, which was a 40 second wait at the title screen, followed by a 4 minute wait once the overworld loads. This is actually the shortest possible wait for a 6 IV modest Pokemon in the entirety of Gen 3. No initial seed is closer to this spread than the one that I aimed for. After 1 hour and 10 minutes, I nail the double frame perfect timing and I get Paella, the 6 IV modest Mewtwo. The reason this took so long is because, well, double frame perfect timing is hard. You try it, seriously, I've got a bunch of Fire Red and Leaf Green RNG tutorials, check them out. Okay, so next up is Clefairy. I'm actually going to be getting the one from the game corner because it requires no egg moves and I don't have to catch it this way. It's the same basic process as Mewtwo and almost the same timing wise. I went for seed 3984, which is about a 43 second wait at the title screen followed by a three and a half minute wait in the game corner. This took me a really long time. It was three hours and 24 minutes of brutal RNG failures. But in the end, I got Kokito, the 5 IV Calm Clefairy. Again, double frame perfect RNGs are difficult, but I still think this is shorter than breeding will be overall, so I thought it was a good decision. The last thing I do in Fire Red is catch a Snorlax. Despite Snorlax also not having any egg moves, I thought catching it would be too difficult compared to breeding, since I am now out of Master Balls. So I caught it and I calced its IVs and then I sent it over to Emerald version. The one thing to note here about Min's strategy is that soft resetting actually works in Fire Red. And while the 6 IV Mewtwo might not have been within reach, there is actually a chance at some point in your life you'd find a half decent Mewtwo while soft resetting in Fire Red. This is because, while I have a very specific list of seeds that I can choose from, that's only because of how methodical we are with the process. Hard reset every time, don't press buttons during the intro. This carefully manipulates the timer one register. The moment soft resetting comes into play, you're hitting all sorts of crazy seeds we've never seen here in RNG land. So, sure, it'd still take a long time, but at least the game literally functions. <laughs> okay, now onto the breeding section. Before we can start breeding, I'll need to get the parents. 
I've already got a Snorlax, and the next one I need is a male Corsola to pass down the Mirror Coat egg move onto Cradilly. I spend an unbelievable amount of time here fishing up for one, and then I level it to 39 using the Elite Four in Emerald version. After that, I only need two more Pokemon, Leap and a Ditto. But these are the ones I'll have to RNG minute, because they need to have very specific IVs as the parents. You see, the way breeding works in these games is that only three total IVs are passed down from the parents, and the other three are generated by the game's PRNG. The way I have planned it is that so I will only get the IVs from one parent, so that the stats of Snorlax and Corsola do not matter at all. In addition, both Lilip and Ditto will have to be calm and adamant natures respectively, since only a female or Ditto can pass down the nature via an Everstone. So it's time to use the painting technique all over again to get a good Lilip and Ditto, and luckily I can get both of them on the same exact seed. Lilip was up first since it was closer to the seed. I wait about 30 seconds to hit the seed and then I confirm I'm there with a wild encounter. After that, I wait about 15 minutes in the battle factory until I am 5,000 advances away, and then I head off to RNG the fossil. It's pretty much the same as Rayquaza or Groudon, and after a few attempts, I have a calm female 3 IV Lilip. After that, since Ditto is on the same seed, I just do another battle factory wait for about 6 minutes, and then I head to the desert underpass to Manipta. It doesn't take long to get my 3 IV Adamant Ditto. I also caught a Slugma with Magma Armor at this point, so I could speed up the egg hatching process. All this breeding prep work took me 2 hours and 29 minutes. Not bad, but not too fast either. As for the breeding RNG, well, it's very simple. Eggs are generated in two parts in this game, something Min actually exploited himself. You see, after you put two eggs in the daycare and bike around to make an egg, the daycare man steps forward to indicate that he is holding one. At this point, the egg is partially generated. The Pokémon's nature, gender, and ability are all determined at that point. But crucially, the IVs are not. RNGing these traits is actually fairly time-consuming. So what I do is generate an egg, save, and then I hatch it and check to see if it has the right nature and ability. If it does, I reset back to before I picked it up and then I could move on to RNGing the IVs. The odds of getting the leap I want from this technique is about 50-50, thanks to the Everstone passing down my calm leap's nature half of the time. Snorlax will be a bit more luck reliant, as I need to hit a 50-50 for the nature and for the ability. Parents' ability in this game are not passed down at all like they are in the later games, so it's a true 50-50 here as well. As for how the egg RNG works, it's just a 1 60th of a second window waiting for a period of time. For Lilip, I actually don't even need to go for a 5 IV, just 4, since it has no damaging moves. Lilip's target was only 1 minute and 14 seconds away. But the downside is that, even with the quick RNG attempts, there's a few problems with Emerald's eggs. One is that determining where I land in the RNG is difficult, because the Pokémon hatch at level 5, and telling what IVs the stats are at this level is not that easy. And two, even with Flame Body, hatching an egg can take a few minutes. To deal with the first problem, I go around collecting all the easily available rare candies, so I can use a multi-stage IV calculator to figure out where I landed. I'm sure many of you are wondering why I didn't just use the stats judge in the Battle Frontier instead of using rare candies. Well, I would need to collect them later on for level ups anyway, but also, the judge actually gives you a random stat if you have more than one perfect IV, and he also has a bias towards special defense. During this challenge, he literally gave me special defense eight times in a row, so he's kind of useless. As for the second problem, there really isn't a fix. I just hit the mock bite and I shmoo. After 1 hour and 24 minutes, I have Maduras, the 4 IV combo leap with the egg move mirror coat from Corsola. Now I just do some trades from Fire Red to Emerald for Snorlax, Paella, and Coquito so that I can begin Snorlax's breeding. Getting the nature and ability proved to take a long time here, about 1 hour for Snorlax. But the setup for the nature slash ability RNG would have required me to register every single trainer in the PokéNav, which takes forever, so I still think it was probably worth it to just do the technique as I did it. After that, the advances for the IV RNG here would be about a 5 minute wait. So I choose to make it shorter by waiting 4.5 minutes in the Battle Factory and then I lose, so I could make each egg RNG wait a lot faster. In total, from start to finish, getting Empanada the 5 IV Snorlax took me about 3 hours flat. Not too bad considering the egg hatching time is brutal here. And with that, we have every single Pokémon with perfect IVs obtained. It took me a total of 13 hours and 43 minutes. The time was split in half almost down the middle. I did it in two streams of about 7 hours each in length, minus some times for breaks and pauses. It is actually insane how slow breeding is. It took the same time to get literally two Pokémon for breeding as it did four Pokémon from static RNG manips. It's just because it requires a bunch of setup, I guess, like the parents and all that type of things. What's cool about this, from my perspective, is that I effectively used the same exact strategy as Min, but with more precision for the egg RNGs. We both generated our eggs initially the same way, as he writes in his war story. Emerald was my breeding ground. That took the longest. But after multiple generations, I got Clefable and Snorlax with the right nature and high IVs. I saved before picking up an egg, since nature, gender, and trait are set, but IVs aren't. And even when it comes to soft resetting, when you think about it, RNG manipulation is just like getting good at soft resetting. The difference between what we did was that I was doing it with a degree of precision unknowable to him at the time. 
there's actually a chance he got his bread Pokemon faster than I did, but my IVs are vastly superior. And again, he was soft resetting for the egg IVs, which, as we know now, does not work in Pokemon Emerald. With that, our new total time is 28 hours and 45 minutes. I actually don't think this is that bad, considering I had to play through two additional games. Alright, well, we're on to the EV training now. Before I start EV training, there is exactly one piece of prep I need to do, which is getting Pokeress. Pokeress doubles the amount of EVs you gain when you KO Pokemon in battle, and it is especially crucial in this gen. But Pokeress is rare. It's a 1 in 21,845 chance to contract it as the battle ends. So I aimed to RNG Manip it. This RNG Manip is very difficult and requires a fairly unique setup. The short of it is that I have to end a battle with a PRNG state that ends in a 16-bit upper of either 4,000, 8,000, or C1,000. The final A press is on the You Gained X Experience text box. This is difficult because 1. It is a triple frame perfect input. You have to encounter a Pokemon, press A to start a battle, and then press A to end a battle all with 1 60th of a second precision for every single one of those presses. 2. Battles cause the RNG to skip advances. Basically, instead of going 1 by 1 at 60 FPS, they skip every other advance, going 2 by 2. While this doesn't mean it's at 120 frames per second, it does mean that if you get unlucky and start the battle on an even advance, but you need to land on an odd advance, you have to change your whole calibration setup. It's very frustrating. And 3. Verifying what advance you hit is really hard. You see, since Pokeress is a binary, you either have it or you don't, you think it'd be impossible to tell where you landed if you didn't get it. Well, it would be, but a genius Gen 3 rng -er named Hatsune Tsumikos realized that pickup occurs a static amount of advances before Pokeruss in the RNG. This means if you fill up a team with 5 Zigzagoons or Lanoons, you can see what items they picked up to know how close or far away you are from your target Pokeruss frame. So I caught 5 Zigzagoons and a Tropius, and I followed their guide. With many hiccups along the way that I do not have time to talk about, I eventually landed on Pokeruss 2 hours and 18 minutes later. Luckily, by the way, the frames I verified pickup on had some rare candies as pickup results, so I snagged four of those calibrating this Manip. As for Min, he isn't clear about if he had Pokeruss or not. It started existing in Gen 2, but considering the rarity and the lack of online info at the time, I wouldn't be surprised if people just didn't know about it or didn't think it was worth it to get it without cheating. Either he took longer to EV train than I did, or he took way longer to get Pokeruss than I did. Either way, what I'm doing is definitely faster. Okay, now we get to EV train. For EV training, there's really only two ways to gain EVs in these games. Pokemon KOs and Vitamins. We'll first talk about the Vitamins. Vitamins grant 10 EVs each per use for whichever stat they represent, but they only give up to 100 EVs before they stop working. Also, they are insanely expensive, at 9,800 Poke Dollars each, so you'd have to do a ton of Monday grinding to get them as well. Aside from Vitamins, there's Pokemon KOs. Every Pokemon grants a specific amount of EVs on KO based on their species. The most EVs a Pokemon can give is 3, but that's typically reserved for fully evolved or legendary Pokemon. For example, Wismer gives 1 HP when you KO it. This can be enhanced further by Pokerust, which we just RNG'd, and the Macho Brace. Both of these double the EVs you get when you KO a Pokemon, and they stack with each other. So Wismer would be doubled to 2 and then 4 respectively, but Xbloud would give 3 HP EVs, which would then be doubled to 6 and 12 respectively. But obviously, fully evolved 3-stage Pokémon or Legendaries are not readily available, right? So what can we do here then? Well, the best strategy that I've actually found is to use Ditto in Emerald. KOing a transformed Ditto in Emerald actually grants you the EVs of the Pokémon it's transformed into, not what Ditto normally gives. This means you can train by swapping into a powerful Pokémon, who Ditto will transform into on the swapped turn. Then, said Pokémon always wins the speed tie because your Pokémon gets the speed badge boost, and Ditto cannot copy that and hopefully you one-hit KO Ditto and then gain 12 EVs. The only real downside to this is that Ditto sits at a 50% encounter rate, which isn't super great, but the amount of KOs you have to do is so much less than anything else. Aiming for 152 EVs after using 10 vitamins, you'd only have to KO 13 Pokémon. If you were to do this against Pokémon who grant 1 EV, aka 4 after all the boosts, it would be 38 KOs. Quite the drastic improvement if you ask me. However, the mid-ground of 2 EVs per KO, aka after 8 after the boost, is actually also very useful. This is only 19 KOs total, so I find that if the encounter rate is high enough, then it's worth it to aim for those Pokémon instead of using the Ditto trick. Now that you understand how EV training works, let's break down my setup and technique. First, I had to grind for money for the Vitamins. A lot of people think money grinding is really slow in Emerald without glitches, but it's basically as fast as the Versus Seeker in Fire Red and Leaf Green. So the way it works is that after you take 255 steps and you change your location, every trainer in the location you walk into who is registered on your PokéNav has a 31% chance to trigger a rematch. If any trainer gets a rematch trigger, the 255 steps is reset. 
If no trainer gets a rematch triggered, the 255 steps are not reset, and you can enter and exit the area again to trigger the 31% chance. If a trainer already has a rematch triggered and is waiting, they are ignored for this process. On Route 104, there's two rich trainers, Lady Cindy and Rich Boy Winston. They each have a Lanoon that is holding a nugget, which you can use Thief on. And then upon defeat, while you're holding an amulet coin, they grant you 14,400 Poke Dollars per victory. The strategy was to go to the lowest part of Rustboro, bike about 10 laps back and forth because that's about 255 steps, and then I walk onto Route 104 and off it five times, and then I would check the match call system in the Poke Nav. It takes about 30 seconds to guarantee that I get a rematch with one of them, and sometimes both of them trigger at once. I need to get 1,234,800 Poke Dollars this way to buy all of the vitamins. This is actually above the game's money cap which is 9,999 Poke Dollars. So I stop once I'm close, I sell my nuggets to hit the money cap, I buy what I can, and then I continue on grinding. Doing this takes me two hours and four minutes to get the grind done and have all the vitamins I would need to EV train. For the actual Pokemon KOs, these are the locations that I use. For HP, I used Meryl and Petalburg City for eight EVs each at a 100% encounter rate while surfing. For attack, I used Ditto in the Desert Underpass, transformed into my Groudon or Swampert for 12 EVs each at a 50% encounter rate. For defense, I used nothing. I only ever used vitamins here. No Pokemon was fully trained in that stat. For special attack, I used Ditto in the Desert Underpass, transformed into my Mewtwo for 12 EVs each at a 50% encounter rate. For special defense, I used Ditto as well, but this time transformed into my Blastoise for 12 EVs each at a 50% encounter rate. And lastly, for speed, I used Golbat in the second room of Meteor Falls for 8 EVs each at a 90% encounter rate while surfing. And the general process went like this. First, I'd give a Pokemon Pokerust by running from a few battles with the infected Tropius in my party. Then, I first trained Mewtwo and Groudon, because they would be the Pokemon I have Ditto turn into later on to train other Pokemon, and while holding the Macho Brace, they're actually slower than Transform Ditto, so I thought it would be best to get them out of the way first. For every other Pokemon, I use a technique known as Swap Training, where I lead with the Pokemon who I need to EV train while they are holding the Macho Brace, and then I swap to a Pokemon in the back who is strong enough to get the KO for them, or is a Pokemon that Ditto needs to turn into. In addition, I keep track of the KOs using the remaining PP of my Pokemon's move. I also get the question all the time for the Gens 4 and 5 videos that I did on this subject. Why don't I use the EXP share instead of swap training? The thing is, before Gen 6, X and Y, the EXP share was a held item. And the item I use to double the amount of EVs that I get, the Macho Brace, is also a held item. Since Pokemon cannot hold two items at once, I find that it is worth it to do swap training but double the EVs that I get, instead of not swap, and then double the amount of Pokemon that I have to KO. It is much faster to do the swap training than it is to use the EXP share. That's why I don't use the EXP share. And then after all my training would be done, I would talk to the lady in Slateport to get the effort driven, to make sure my Pokemon was maxed out on EVs. Alright, so let's cover what each individual Pokemon needed to train, and how long they took. First up was Quesadilla the Groudon. I give them 10 HP ups and 10 proteins. Then I KO'd 19 Meryl for max HP, and 12 Ditto and 1 Mightyena for max attack. Then I finished them off with a Zinc. This took 20 minutes. Really not that bad, especially because I expect Groudon and Mewtwo to be the worst ones thanks to the Macho Brace slowing them down and making Ditto get a turn in, whereas normally they wouldn't. Next up, I tackled Paella the Mewtwo, who I gave 10 Carvos and Calcium to. After that, I KO'd 19 Golbat, 12 Ditto, and 2 Spinda to max out speed and special attack, respectively. I finished Mewtwo off with 1 Iron to cap out their defense. This took around 18 minutes. So far, very comparable to both Gens 4 and 5, which is pretty good considering they have much better tools for this than Gen 3 does. After Paella was Enchilada the Rayquaza, my final legendary. I gave them 10 Protein and Carbos, and then I KO'd 19 Golbats for max speed, and after that I KO'd 12 Ditto Swap Trained via Groudon, and then 2 Shuppet to cap out attack. I finalized the EVs with the Zinc for 4 Special Defense. This took 28 minutes. I guess I underestimated how much Swap Training will slow down the process. Hopefully I could pick up the pace for the next one. Empanada the Snorlax was next up for the gym. I start with 10 HP ups and 10 Proteins, and after that it's 12 Dittos via the Swap Training and 2 Shuppet for max attack followed by 19 Merrills to maximize HP. I finished him off with an Iron for defense. All in all, Snorlax took 20 minutes flat. I'm really not sure why this went so quickly. Perhaps I just got luckier on the Ditto spawns? Kokito was ready for training next, and I started her with 10 HP ups and 10 Zinc. After that, it was 12 Dittos transformed into Blastoise. Or so I thought. I actually forgot to use Zinc, and I almost lost count of my Ice Beams, so I had to pivot into using my brain for a moment. I paused the special defense training and maximized HP against 19 Merrills. Then I KO'd two Shanshrew in the desert, with one Bracer and one without, which gave me exactly six defense EVs. Now I could finish off special defense grinding until I could get the effort ribbon without worrying about stats being inaccurate. Because of this screw up, Kokito took 39 minutes to train. I think it's fine, accidents happen. But you really have to pay a lot of attention in these older games, it can be really frustrating. 
but I guess that's what makes it feel good in the end. As when I successfully trained something, I know I was able to focus for a long time effectively. Or maybe I'm just crazy, I don't know. Finally, we have Maduros, my Lilith. Maduros has exactly the same EV spread as Coquito, and I do the same thing, except I do not forget to give him the vitamins. It takes 29 minutes to fully train him, and the reasoning is pretty clear. It's Blastoise. You see, Blastoise cannot easily KO itself while transformed, so the training takes a bit longer than average. Ideally, I should be using the roaming Latias for this, but ah well. I don't think I wasted too much time considering how long it would take to catch it otherwise. And with that, we've completed the EV training. If you count the money grind, this took me 5 hours and 2 minutes, which is quite a lengthy process. If you only count the training itself, it was 3 hours flat, which is honestly not as bad as I expected. But do you know what's even faster than that? Clicking the subscribe button down below. It helps me out for free, and I'm trying to get to 50k subs this year. These team building videos take an insanely long time to make, and a lot of effort. And I stream live right here on YouTube making them. So clicking down below notifies you of that too. Thanks. Anyway, comparing this to what Min did will be a bit difficult, but we can break it down by timing some things. The best money grinding spot in Fire Red and Leaf Green is on Five Island. These two ladies give you 20,000 Poké Dollars every time you defeat them with the Amulet Coin. That's only about 600 more than we get from Lady Cindy and Winston each. But the Versus Seeker is undeniably faster at money farming. It's only 100 steps of rematch instead of 255, and it's a 70% chance for a rematch at a worst case scenario instead of Emerald's 31%. However, this advantage is marginal at best, and Emerald wins out in the EV training department for speed. You see, the Ditto trick is not really doable in Fire Red and Leap Green. Its most common encounter is 25%, as opposed to Emerald's 50%. On top of that, the EV training in this game requires you using the Versus Seeker against trainers to get two EVs reliably, like our speed and HP setups would. And every stat would use the two EVs, and no stat would be using three EVs consistently. This means that the Versus Seeker limitation applies to EV training as well. And while 100 steps is pretty good for money grinding, for EV training, an Emerald will be getting into battles much faster than that, and gaining EVs faster as a result of Ditto giving three EVs each. I think in general, whichever game you choose is fine. You gain very minor optimizations depending on which game you choose. I timed EV training a Pokemon in both games, including the money grind, and Emerald wins out by literally 2 minutes, assuming you went with 252 speed, 252 special attack, with optimal setups for each. With that said, our new total time is 36 hours and 21 minutes. I think it's crazy how using Fire Red and Leaf Green is almost as fast as using Emerald in this game, and I think back then, the Emerald rematch system wasn't understood, and the Ditto trick was probably not widely known about. It's just crazy how close they were to being optimal back then, as I was now. Uh, anyway, the next thing I need to do is get every Pokemon to have all of their proper moves. Getting the correct moves started with just using whatever TMs I currently had. So Enchilada got Earthquake and Maduros got Toxic. I had already taught Aerial Ace to both Enchilada and Quesadilla for effective EV training earlier, so I didn't have to use those right now. At this point, I still need a few more TMs. 5 Protects, 1 Reflect, and Ice Beam and Thunderbolt. But they all cost money, so I do some grinding against Cindy and Winston to afford them. Reflect and Protect are at Lily Cove, and the other two are Game Corner TMs. Protect goes on every Pokémon except Groudon, and Reflect goes on Clefairy. The Thunderbolt and Ice Beam TMs go on to Mewtwo. So now I trade Snorlax to XD to teach it Self-Destruct at the Agate Move Tutor, then I use the Shadow Ball TM I have there on it, along with the PP Max on Shadow Ball. Then I give it the Health Item Leftovers, and I trade it back. After that, I swap memory cards to my second copy of XD, and I teach Self-Destruct to Mewtwo. Next up, we've got some Move Tutor moves in Fire Red to use. I also need to evolve Kokito, which I could have done a while ago, or even before I traded it, but that's fine. First, I go to the Celadon department store, and I use a single-use Move Tutor for counter on Kokito there. After that, I head to 4 Island to teach Body Slam to Quesadilla via the Move Tutor, and then to 7 Island to teach it Swords Dance, also via Move Tutor. Keep in mind, all three of these moves are single-use move tutors, and if I want to get them again, I have to either replay Fire Red again all the way through, or I would have to teach them via Emerald Battle Points, which could take a long time. T truly ridiculous. At this point, I evolve Kokito and trade her and Quesadilla back to Emerald's version. The only thing left to do was level up Maduros to 29 for Confuse Ray and Empanada to 33 for Body Slam. At this point, I'm all done, and now we can... What? What's that? There's one more move? <sighs> right. It's time for the Battle Frontier. The Battle Frontier is a beloved addition to Pokemon Emerald, where you can take on seven different challenging battle facilities, each with a unique gimmick to their playstyle. And for winning whatever that specific facility determines is a round, usually seven battles or something like that, you gain BP, the Frontier's currency, which can only be earned there or used there. So there are three things I need from here, the first of which is a move, and the other two are items. A lot of people really like the Emerald Battle Frontier, but I really, really do not. The BP gain is painfully slow, and all the challenges are rigged against you by double team spammers, and as we already saw, raising a team can take forever. I haven't even finished it yet. My first instinct here was to RNG Eladios from Southern Island, 
as it's the Frontier Killer, as shown by the very impressive all gold speed runs. So I busted out my copy of Ruby, my Nintendo e-reader, and my totally legit, definitely real Eon ticket, and I scanned it into the game. Emerald can't actually use the e-reader system in English, but if you mix records with a Ruby or Sapphire who did receive the Eon ticket, you get it in Emerald and gain access to Southern Island, which is exactly what I did. At this point, I realized I was in over my head, and I forgot how messed up the Gen 3 capture rates are. I thought I could just waltz into Southern Island, hit my target advance, which was only a 1 minute and 16 second wait, and chuck Ultra and Timer Balls at it while it was in Yellow Hell. I was very, very wrong. After repeatedly failing to catch the Latios for two hours, I decided I needed to break. And you know what? I also really wanted to prove a point about something here. You see, I decided to tackle the Battle Factory. I am sure lots of people would have said on the comments of this video, Oh, you could just do the Battle Factory. You don't need to spend your time completing Latios to do the Frontier when you could just use Rentals. I am here to show you and prove to you that this is very, very wrong. While yes, the factory does quite literally require zero setup, you only get 3 BP for the first two rounds. Then it increases by 1 BP every round after that for a while. One round is 7 wins. You have to do 7 wins in a row just to get 3 BP. Yes, beating the factory brain gives you 14 for the silver and 15 for the gold, but good luck getting there. There's a few reasons this is what I think the toughest facility and the most random facility. That's right, I think this facility is more random than the Battle Pike, which labels itself as the Luck Facility, and the Battle Palace, which is the facility where you don't even get to pick moves for your Pokémon. They do it on their own randomly based on your natures, and I still think the Battle Factory is more luck-based than both of those. For one, the Factory is bugged. Just like everything else in Emerald, the Battle Factory does not function properly. You see, the Pokémon you pick at the start of your round, and the enemy's trainer's Pokémon all start off kinda bad. They are weaker Pokémon species-wise, and also they have all threes as their IVs. But the game is supposed to increase your IVs and the opponent's IVs based on your current win streak, but it only increases the IVs of the Pokémon you pick at the start of your win streak, and all your opponent's IVs are actually based off your current win streak and the level 50 battle tower, thanks to a badly done copy and paste job. This heavily disincentivizes swapping, the central mechanic to the Battle Factory, because you'll mostly be swapping down to worse stats. Oh, and of course the Factory Brain's IVs aren't bugs, so his Pokémon are all either 15 or 31 depending on which metal fight this is for. Second of all, it is a heavily luck-dependent facility. Even under perfect scenarios, you can get an unlucky matchup and instantly lose your streak because you are not preparing your own team. There are double team spammers and Endor Reversal users everywhere, and there's just not answers to them sometimes because you're not picking the moves for your Pokémon. And lastly, with Emerald's Broken RNG, this means the Pokémon you get at the start are not actually going to vary that much, since this RNG is also affected by that bug. Now luckily, there is a very handy workaround to this, in the fact that you could RNG the starting Pokémon for the factory, which is exactly what I do. The problem with this is that if you miss your target, you're flying blind without a strategy. I managed to get the silver medal with this strat, but then I lost in rounds 4 or 5. I try a few more times, but I fail at the silver medal or before it. It's really, really difficult. At this point, I switch over to the Battle Factory doubles, because I have heard it's easier. And it kind of is. It gives more points by one per round, and in general, I was able to achieve about the same success as I was without Manips. But I was consistently losing to unwinnable matchups and double team spammers. And the more that happened, the more my brain turned to jelly. But four hours later, that's right, four hours later, I had 48 BP to get Endor, the final move I needed on Groudon. Even with optimal conditions, I think this is obviously not the play. I think maybe, maybe if I was lucky, I could have sped it up by like an hour. And also, there's no Manips past the gold. So, I don't really know how much more I could have improved this. At this point, we have every move on every Pokémon, and it only took me 7 hours and 11 minutes. Yes, this counts the Latios fails, but still, come on! And I still need 2 more items from here. The worst part? They cost 64 BP each instead of 48. <sighs> okay, okay, listen. All the moves are done, and we're at 43 hours and 33 minutes. We can just regroup and try again later with a different technique. While I calm down, let's talk about some of Min's stranger choices. Judging from Smogon threads at the time, and Min's own war story, people were extremely critical of him for both item, Pokémon, and move choices especially. Again, I recommend reading Min's war story yourself, but let's go over his reasoning. The first two are obvious, Protect Choice Bander Quaza and Cradilly in general. He actually says he never intended to bring either of them into battle, and never did. This is not unheard of. I've seen Wolf Glick say in his first season of VGC or so, he effectively had a set team of four he'd always bring, instead of actually choosing from the six that he had. On top of that, this is the first season of double battles ever in a tournament series, and the first ever bring six pick four format. 
It was new and kind of weird compared to what in-game happens in the main series and the fan competitive single scenes do. It's also not like choice ban Rayquaza wouldn't have been a threat. Rayquaza in general was meant to disincentivize other weather users as well, so uh, Kyogre's wouldn't threaten his Groudon as much, via its ability. Cradilly is a lot stranger, and he doesn't talk much about it, but the general plan was for it to be able to survive explosions and self-destructs with its rock typing, and also live super effective ice beams and dish back mirror coats. Snorlax and Mewtwo are pretty obvious picks, and I think anyone in modern day can see why a Follow Me Clefable would be valuable in a double format these days. It basically exists to live a turn or two while Groudon sets up swords dances. No, the real issue here is Groudon's incredibly strange moveset of Aerial Ace, Body Slam, Endure, and Swords Dance. But Min is extremely clear with his reasoning. Based on other tournaments and online discussions, he had become aware that imprisoned Dusclops would be able to shut his Groudon down by imprisoning Earthquake. He also reasoned that Earthquake with Clefable as a partner is a bad idea. It either has to take a turn to protect or take a ton of damage. Lastly, since protects are often scattered by the enemy, it's not like Earthquake will often hit both Pokemon at the same time. So he chose to drop it. He says that Body Slam is the best single target no drawback move for Groudon, and Aerial Ace was chosen just to be able to have another move that was single target that could hit ghost types. You can read his reasoning for why all the other moves were bad according to him on the screen here, via his war story. Even if, by modern standards, we think he undervalued Rock Slide or overvalued Imprisoned Dusclops, I think his creativity and planning for this event should be nothing but praised. It undeniably helped him to get the wins on several occasions. Okay, now that I've cooled off, let's finish up in the Battle Frontier. The last two things I need from the Battle Frontier are the Choice Band and Bright Powder. Both cost the aforementioned 64 BP. The only other way to get these items are either from the Ruby Sapphire Battle Tower, which gives you one of nine random items every time you complete a streak of seven after a total streak of 42 wins. So potentially that could be faster than the Frontier, but I think consistency is valuable. Relying on blind luck is just not good. The other way would be to use Mountain Battle, but the rate which you gain Poke Coupons at is also not fast. I think it's a pick your poison type of scenario, and my poison is the Battle Frontier. Okay, so my new plan is to exploit the NPC known as the Gambler of the Battle Frontier. This dude is just south of the Battle Pyramid, and every day he wants you to gamble on a new facility. He lets you give him up to 15 BP, and if you win a streak in that facility, he gives you back 30 BP. This is extremely exploitable, because he only changes the facility once a day. Or, in my case, never, because my battery is dead and you can just win round one of whatever facility he picks fairly easily, and then gain 15 BP for winning against a bunch of, like, not fully evolved Pokemon. There is, of course, a catch, because why wouldn't there be an Emerald version? You need three silver medals for him to let you gamble with him, so I will be revisiting the Latios plan and then taking on the two easiest facilities. Ultimately, I decided that Smeargle and Absol were going to be the key components to catching this Latios consistently. Latios only has Psychic-type moves for damaging moves, which Absol is not affected by and then Absol could use Taunt to prevent Latios from spamming Dragon Dance and Recover. And Absol has Pressure, making the damage moves disappear twice as quick as they would normally. Smeargle is the obvious choice here as the catching Pokémon for its ability to learn Spore, Ball Swipe, Shadow Ball, and Taunt. So first up is catching the Smeargle. I RNG Manip a Smeargle at level 50 with high enough speed that, when fully EV trained, it'll outspeed Latios by one point when Smeargle is at level 52. Then I trade over Parasect and Marowak for my Fire Red who know both Spore and False Swipe respectively. Then I teach Smeargle all of the previously listed moves via the Trainer's Eye Double Battle Rematch on the Daycare Route. After that, I do a small amount of money farming to buy some X Speeds, X Attacks, as well as to farm more Ultra Balls and Timer Balls. All this farming took about an hour and 30 minutes just to set up Smeargle and Absol. Then the general strategy would go like this. Attempt an RNG on Latios, which is only a 1 minute and 15 second timer, then I would leave with Absol and spam Taunt until Latios is out of damaging moves. At that point, I would switch to Smeargle. Then I would get Smeargle to plus 6 attack and speed using the X items. This lets me outspeed it to Sport, and False Swipe gets it to 1 HP in 2 hits. An hour later, I catch the Latios I am aiming for. This is actually the same one speedrunners use for the all gold Frontier speedruns. It's a 31 in special attack and a 29 in speed with a modest nature, and fairly bulky all around. At this point, I have to EV train it, but I want to use it at the level 50 facilities, not the open level ones, because those start at level 60, and training this Latios for 10 levels would take quite a while. So, I opt to use an extremely cursed EV training technique. But before that, it's the usual money grinding for vitamins, 10 Carbos and 10 Calcium. Then, to minimize EXP gain, I swap train against extremely low EXP targets while having the Pokémon I swap to wearing the EXP share. You see, in Gen 3, if more than one Pokémon battle, and one of those Pokémon is holding the EXP share, they split the experience by 50% twice. Once for the swap, and once for the EXP share. So the Pokémon holding the EXP share gets a majority of the EXP. So, I trade against Zubats and Altering Cape for speed, having to KO 38 of them, and against Spindas and Slugmas on Route 113 for special attack. 
also 38 of them. As you can see, I barely even have one fourth of the EXP needed to get to level 51. I know what you're thinking though. Don't you have to level it up to gain EVs? Nope. If you put a Pokemon in the box and take it out, the EVs are updated. This doesn't work at level 100, unfortunately, though, since you need to be able to gain EXP to gain EVs in this game. Anyway, Latios is all trained up now. It took about another hour because I was swap training for like 76 Pokemon, but it's also not the only Pokemon I'm going to use. It is not a good enough guarantee for the Silvers all on its own, so I level up Snorlax to 50 using the Wally rematch in Victory Road. He has a higher EXP per minute rate than the Elite Four does, actually. I could have probably traded to Fire Red, but this many levels didn't really take a long time, only about an hour, so I don't really think it would have saved much time, especially if you count the trading process, which unfortunately takes like 5-6 to six minutes, just for one trade sometimes. Anyway, once Snorlax is level 50, I delete Protect and I teach an Earthquake, and I decide it's not worth it to get a third team member. I think these two will be enough to get the two remaining silvers that I need. The last thing I do is get the proper items. For Latios, I use a Lumberry. The Soul Dew does not work in the Battle Frontier, so I think this is the best option. Lots of people love to spam Toxic and Thunder Wave, and this is a get out of jail free card. For Snorlax, I go and get the Quick Claw from the Trainer School, since it's the only easy item to get that's good for him, and it's the actual item he'll be needing for his final moveset anyway, that Min used in the tournament. Since I didn't want to get a third teammate, I decide to just bring along a level 27 Tropius with me as I enter the Battle Dome. This is a unique facility, sort of similar to the Pokemon World Tournament from Black and White 2 versions. It's a tournament structure where you see what three Pokemon your opponent has, and then each of you get to pick two of your Pokemon to bring along into the battle. I always bring my Latios and Snorlax, naturally, and I blast my way to the Silver Medal in 33 minutes, earning 16 total BP along the way. A pro tip for the Dome Brain is that the Swamperts in the Battle Frontier always have Counter and Mirror Coat, basically, and they love to spam it, so it's a free setup opportunity for Latios, who can just spam Calm Mind until it's plus 6 and then one-hit KO everything on the team. So, with the dome done, up next is the Battle Pike, which is called the Luck Facility. But really, I think it's just the easiest one in the whole game, especially to get the Silver Medal. This place is a bit weird, but basically, you choose between three different rooms, and they each have a random outcome of what could be in them. It's either a hallway with wild Pokémon, a trainer battle, getting randomly statused like Poison or Paralyzed, a heal, or just nothing at all. The goal is to avoid the status conditions and get either heals, wild Pokémon, or nothing. You can just run from the wild Pokémon, that's why it's easy there. After you make it through 14 total rooms, you fight Lucy for the silver medal. And hilariously, after 10 minutes, I made it to Lucy and lost. I didn't remember or realize the menace that was her toxic stall shuckle. So I give it another go, and after 10 minutes, I defeat her easily. And I've gained a total of 13 points from this facility. We are now sitting at 35 out of 128 needed. <sighs> Why do these cost so much? So now that I have three silver medals, I go over to the gambler, and he tells me he's betting on singles in the battle tower. The strategy here is to just give him 15 BP, run to the tower, win 7 battles for 1 BP, and then go to him and claim my reward, which is 30 BP. Then I go to the tower and reset the game after it saves to get the lady at the counter to yell at me and force my streak to end. At this point, it's a rinse and repeat. I go to the gambler, give him 15 BP, and win 1 round again for another 16 BP total. This is by far the fastest BP yield for how easy it is. The only other things that even come close to this is having a gigantic streak in the Battle Dome or the Battle Tower or something like that. But you would also need to breed a specific team just for that, so I think this is an extremely effective way to grind, uh, especially if you only need a few items. From 35 BP to 128, it took me 52 minutes to get what I needed. This is really fast. I, I think this is even comparable to having a full prepped Battle Tower team for this, uh, so I would highly recommend everyone try this method. Even if you don't get a facility as good as the tower, Latios is probably good enough to carry you in round one through any facility, uh, barring the palace or the factory, which, you know, it's going to be a little tougher, but they should still be doable. At this point, I have five of the six items I require for Min's team. I already have the Quick Claw Lumberry and Leftovers, and I just bought the Choice Band and Bright Powder using BP. The last item I need is the Salak Berry, which for some reason is pretty rare. The only consistent way to get it typically is through the Poke Coupon system in Colosseum or XD, but I've got a way to let me get it instantly. Unfortunately, it'll have to wait until I finish the next task, because it requires me to be able to restart my Ruby version. For Min, it's unclear what techniques he used to acquire the items. I'm not even sure if he prepped using the Battle Frontier or the Battle Tower, but what we can talk about is his item choices. Just like his move selections, he also got a ton of criticism for using the hacks items like Quick Claw and Bright Powder. For example, to win his Washington DC regional, Min got a lucky Quick Claw proc with his Snorlax and that won the match. And then crucially, in the national finals, his Mewtwo dodged several Hydro Pumps from a Kyogre. But the Mewtwo was holding Bright Powder, 
So think about if you were the Kyogre user relying on two Focus Blast hits to win your match. That's what you'd be doing. I'm not sure I'd bet the National Championship on that. But regardless of that, a lot of people perceived Min's wins through Lux, or Hacks, as the Pokemon community calls it. But in reality, there is just not a ton of items in Gen 3 that are very good. There's maybe 10 or 11 usable items, plus some berries. Nowadays, we are spoiled with variety, but back then, not so much. Min says this himself in his War Story. I think criticizing the player for using the items that are legal in the format is silly. It doesn't take away the victory that Min had to win all of the matches up until that point, and in the end, his item choice did pay off. So, I think you shouldn't criticize a person for that type of thing. It is a toxic mentality that I think is slowly shifting away, but you do still see lots of players complain about hacks. It, even myself, I get mad when double protects go off. But I think as a community, we need to move away from this, and in general, people are better about it now. Anyway, now we have every Pokemon we need with all of the right moves, all of the right items, and they're all EV trained. We're at a total of 50 hours and 8 minutes, a truly gargantuan amount of time. And we're not even done! Now we have to get all 6 Pokemon to level 100, the pinnacle of power for a Pokemon. Very few Pokemon ever reach this level. This is a section of the video where I push my Pokemon's level to the absolute limit by raising them to level 100 in an unconventional way in Gen 3's environment. Because, more or less, I'm crazy. This is the level 100 gauntlet. So, yeah, I've alluded to this before, but we've got to grind. And I'll be honest, there is no fast way to do this. But I think the way I've chosen is the best. The way I'm grinding is via the pickup ability in Pokemon Ruby, for the most part anyway. Pickup is an ability in Ruby and Sapphire that gives a Pokemon with that ability the chance to have a held item after you defeat a Pokemon in battle. It's a 10% chance for there to be any item at all, and then the various items you can get are organized by percentage rarity. Ruby and Sapphire are the best for this, because unlike in most other Pokemon games, where the items you can get via pickup improve as a Pokemon levels up, in Ruby and Sapphire, the items are always the same, and it's the best version of the pickup table from later games. The two items I am interested in are the Rare Candy and the PP Up. The Rare Candy is a generous 10%, and the PP Up is a not-so-generous 4%. The plan is to use two Game Boys. One has my Emerald, where I grind every Pokemon who isn't level 60 to around there, and one has my Ruby, where I spam pickup. Once every Pokemon is 60, I switch to using my Japanese Sapphire, where I dual spam pickup. At this level, pickup is going to be nearly or more effective as gaining experience points to level up, because the amount of EXP you gain to level up at that point is insane. On top of that, I'm hitting two birds with one stone, farming PP ups and rare candies at the same time. This was insanely tedious and boring, and there is just no solution. I also was playing two games at once, which isn't easy for me to do, especially during the level grind part, where I couldn't keep the game synchronized. So, to keep you entertained while I grind, I bring you an interview with Journey Across America, Florida Regional winner, and New York Nationals competitor, Mistrevis. So with me I have Mistrevis, the Florida Regional winner for the Journey Across America tournament. I actually met you through the Pokemon RNG scene a while ago, and I only found out you were the winner of the tournament after doing some digging for Min's team and finding the videos on your channel. Uh, but for those that don't know you, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, who are you, how long have you been playing, and what formats uh, do you enjoy? Sure, uh, I'm Mistrevis, or Nick, if you want to call me that. Uh, I've been playing Pokemon casually since, I guess it was, I want to say 1999, I believe it was, uh, shortly after Red came out. And I enjoy mostly the, the older formats have a special place in my heart, such as the Journey Across America one, but I'll play just about any format at any time. So do you remember the general process you were using to build the team? Yeah, I got several battle, well, more than several, a lot of battle <laughs> points because I grinded the hell out of the uh, battle factory. I got a lot of battle points from that, which I needed to teach explosion to my Metagross. I think I actually got my Groudon Rock Slide from Fire Red Leaf Green. Yeah, single um, use there, right? There. Um, as, other than that, I just, well, several of my Pokemon for the qualifier, they were just ones I had played through the story with. Like half my team was stuff I really put a lot of effort into like resetting for, although still they weren't, I mean, we didn't have RNG at the time and I didn't hack, so I was kind of up the I, creek sort of. Actually, I want to ask you about that. So, yeah, um, go ahead. so because there's not RNG back then, right? Nobody knew about it. Um, right. what type of compromises did you have to make in so far in Nature's and IV's go? One thing I compromised was Nature's and I just like, when I was going resetting for speed, I just, you know, this is a high enough IV, I'll take it rather than with my Mewtwo, I need Timid, 31 IV. Yeah, I gotcha. Or something along those lines. So, um, things like that. I mainly just shot for 
high enough IVs of a nature that I considered decent at the time, or if I got IVs I was really pleased with, I might settle with a less than ideal nature. Uh, were you using any glitches at the time? Was the Emerald Clone glitch known back then? Uh, it was, but I, I believe it was, but I actually didn't use it at the time. Mm. I've, I've used it many times since then, but yeah. I didn't do it at the time. I don't know why. I had no problem doing it in Gold, Silver, Crystal, but I just never <laughs> got into the hang of it in Emerald. How does the building for the Journey Across America compare to what it's like today? And what did you think was your favorite uh, gen to like actually build the team in in game? Okay, I'd say the easiest one I did was Gen Five, just because of how easy the RNG is for in most cases. <laughs> it is really easy. Were you aware of any hacking going on at the time? Yeah, most people use either Action Replay or Game Shark. Mm -hmm. Most people who hacked, I'll say, I'm not gonna sit there and say most people hacked. I know of one instance where someone was apparently the night before the tournament they were on uh, IRC. They were on there uh, bragging about how they had hacked their uh, their team for the event. And this person ended up winning the event. I won't say which one, um, but the person they beat in the finals found was uh, on the IRC at the time and heard about it. Oh. And they were very offended by it, of course, because they ended up losing to that the person in the hack team. Uh, but did you enjoy the finals? Min was fairly heavy, heavily criticized by players at the time. Uh, but reading his war story about like how he planned his team and why because a lot of his move selections are very strange but i thought them i found them to be like very well thought out and interesting actually uh so did you enjoy him and what did you think of his play well uh i yeah i enjoyed it i thought the the play was pretty high level yeah i thought the whole uh, what i don't have i thought i had uh somewhere recorded because i believe i did record at the time was top four uh i don't at least i don't believe i have it um, but one thing I remember was Men's Clefable. Uh, I think somewhere on the team is Reflect, isn't there? Yeah, his Clefable uh, has Reflect. Oh, Reflect, I see it now. I was just looking at the the three lines at the top, and I saw something missing. Uh, yeah, they set up, Clefable set up Reflect, and it also had Counter, right? Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, and somebody, the person he was playing against had, I think it was an Electrode that exploded exploded into it and it survived and countered the explosion back oh that's so uh men if you're seeing this and i'm incorrect i apologize but i do seem to recall that happening that is uh, I, that's crazy <laughs> yeah I, th I thought and i thought that was a pretty uh pretty great selection just to anticipate the explosion and counter it back awesome well i appreciate uh everything you've talked to me about and uh uh, your time with me. Uh, this is very fun to hear about all this type of stuff. Uh, is there any like? Do you have, like? Do you want to plug your Twitter or YouTube or anything like that? Or um... yeah, my Twitter and YouTube are both uh, Nick Harper PKMN. Okay. If you'd like to reach me, you're more than welcome to. And I also go by Mistrevis on uh, Smogon and a few other Pokemon sites you may find me on. So I hope you all enjoyed the interview. But now after that, we spent 17 hours collecting rare candies and PP ups. All we've got left to do is farm the overworld ones from the other games. In Fire and Leaf Green, there's nine PP ups and one PP max. And in Emerald, there's also nine PP ups, but two PP max. In addition, I used a PP max from XD on Snorlax. So we're actually at four PP ups over the requirement, uh, counting all the ones that I picked up. I also won't be using any PP ups on self-destruct since you can only use it once per battle. It seems wasteful too. After trading everyone over and leveling them, we're sitting at 69 hours and 19 minutes. Unreal. It's actually still not the longest one of these I've taken though, but we have to get the final item, the Salak Berry. And here's where I use a secret extra game. So the American Pokemon Coliseum bonus disc gives a Jirachi to a copy of Ruby or Sapphire, and that's really all it does. But we don't care about this garbage Jirachi with bad stats. We care about its held item. It has a 50-50 chance to hold either a Salak Berry or a Ganlon Berry. The disc itself gives out an unlimited amount of Jirachi, but it only does it once per save file of Ruby or Sapphire. This is why I had to wait to get the last item. With the pickup farming done, I can now trade over a Jirachi. It had a Ganlon Berry, so I reset the save, and then I receive a second Jirachi. And in my second Jirachi, it has the Salak Berry. In total, between all the trading and such, it took 28 minutes to get the Salak Berry. This is so much faster than getting 15,000 Poke Coupons in Kalo or XD. Uh, or beating Battle CD 44 and XD. I, I just think it's much simpler and easier this way.
With the Salak Berry acquired, I have finally completed Min's team. Our final time is an insane 69 hours and four. You see, I've been keeping a secret from all of you. My capture DS, my DS Lite, and one of my Game Boy Advances are all modded with the GB Accelerator mod chip, which allows me to overclock my game consoles and speed them up on real hardware. I can and have been playing all the GBA games nearly the entire time at 1.7 times the speed I normally play them at. Accounting for any time I took an XD, during RNG manips, or on the Game Boy Player, all times I could not speed up the game, this challenge took me 107 hours, 3 minutes, and 11 seconds. I have to be honest, this messed me up. <laughs> this was by far the worst of any of these challenges I have ever attempted. Everything was pretty much fine until I hit the Battle Frontier wall, and then it started draining me. The Frontier just requires so much investment for you to gain anything out of it and get anything fast from it. And then after that, getting PP ups and leveling six Pokemon to level 100 in this game is just not fun or easy or fast in any way, shape, or form. 17 years of hindsight did almost nothing for me outside of the RNG minutes, which of course made the speed go from, you know, infinite to possible. Uh, all I can say is that I'm glad things improved from here in later games. And, you know, I complained a lot about Gens 8 and 9, but I am spoiled by them, honestly, <laughs> compared to this. Also, I just found out that there's a clone glitch in this game. Did anyone know about this? You can get rare candy so fast this way. I want to give a big thank you to all of my YouTube channel members. Your guys' support means so much to me because these videos take so long to make. Thank you very much. A special shout out to my Blissey tier members, Shirai West, Lactose, Brain, YNC, AB Twisty, and Fragiles. I really, really appreciate the generous support from you guys. And I want to give an even bigger shout out to my Blist God tier members. R-L-I-Z-T, Kima Roki, and Shadow Blitz 56. Your guys' support is unbelievable. Thank you so, so much. I hope everyone enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all next time.